I want to welcome all of you to the 2018 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture in Epidemiology. My name is David Murray. I'm the Associate Director for Prevention here at NIH and also the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. I'm pleased to represent Dr. Collins today to tell you about the Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture and introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I want to let everybody know that uh, there will be time for questions after the presentation. There are microphones in each of the aisles, and I know that they're working because I was here when they were tested. I would also like to invite you to join me at a reception for our speaker in the library, uh, just off to my left, after the presentation. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Gordon Lecture Award. Robert S. Gordon, Jr. Lecture uh, is awarded each year to a scientist who's made major contributions to research or training in the field of epidemiology or in the conduct of clinical trials. The Gordon Lecture recipient is selected based on the recommendation of the NIH Epidemiology and Clinical Trials Interest Group. This is the 24th year that the Office of Disease Prevention has sponsored uh, the Gordon Lecture. The list of prominent scientists who have previously been recognized and received this award can be found on our office's website, prevention.nih.gov. The Gordon Lecture was established in tribute to Robert S. Gordon, Jr. for his dedication to the field of epidemiology and his distinguished service to NIH. Over the course of 30 years, Dr. Gordon served in numerous senior leadership positions, including special assistant to the director, chief advisor for clinical practice and research. He was an early organizer of efforts to address the emerging problem of HIV and AIDS and became a key coordinator of AIDS research at NIH. For the last 10 years of his service uh, while working here at NIH, he made important contributions to policy and management issues regarding epidemiology, clinical trials, and the health effects of environmental hazards. Today's speaker, Dr. Ana diaz Ru received her MD from the University of Buenos Aires in 1985 and an MPH in epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health in 1991. She earned her PhD in health policy and management in 1995 also from Johns Hopkins. She began her academic career a little further north in Columbia, at Columbia University in 1996 as an assistant professor of medicine and epidemiology. She moved to uh, the University of Michigan as an associate professor of epidemiology in 2003 and on to professor of epi uh, there in 2006. While she was at the University of Michigan, she was a research professor in the Institute for Social Research, director of the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program at Michigan, and uh, served as the director for the Center for Social Epidemiology and Population Health. She became chair of epidemiology at uh, Michigan in 2012. She moved two years later to Drexel 2014 as Dean and Distinguished Professor of Epidemiology in the Dornsife School of Public Health. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Epidemiologic Society, and the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research. She is known for her research on the social determinants of population health and the study of how neighborhoods affect health. Her research areas include social epidemiology and health disparities, environmental health effects, urban health, psychosocial factors in health, cardiovascular disease epidemiology, and one of my favorite topics, the use of multi-level methods. Her presentation is entitled Advancing Population Health, Five Propositions and a Research Agenda. Uh, I look forward to this talk, and I'm sure you do. Please now join me in welcoming the 2018 Robert S. Gordon, Jr. Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Ana diaz Ru. Thank you, David, for that uh, very kind introduction. Good afternoon to you all. It's, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, here delivering this, this lecture uh, to you this afternoon. Um, and what I thought I would do is um, take advantage of this opportunity to share with you some thoughts and reflections on population health. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, well, what is population health, very briefly. Uh, suggest five propositions on population health and talk a little bit about what their implications are for research and potentially for policy as well, and then conclude with some thoughts on a pretty, what you'll see is a pretty broad, but I hope still interesting uh, research agenda. 
So if we think about population health, uh, there are multiple visions of population health, as I'm sure you know. If we do a quick uh, web search, you'll find a lot of websites that talk about population health and population health management. This has become increasingly common over the past few years. And most of these, uh, uh, most of these really are, are, are focused on a, a pretty narrow, what I would call a pretty narrow definition of population health, which is an approach that tracks outcomes of collections of patients in order to assess and improve quality of care and increase cost effectiveness of healthcare interventions. So this is certainly very important, and it's good to see that medicine is, is thinking about this. But there are also a broader ways to think about population health, and here's one example of a a definition that was um, uh, that has been highly uh, cited: um, uh, the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. And uh, it, under this uh, conceptualization, uh, population health includes health outcomes, but also patterns of health determinants and policies and interventions that link this to these two. Now, this 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 broader view of thinking about population health is grounded in even earlier definitions, including this one from the late 1990s, where um, population health is defined as a, a conceptual framework for thinking about why some populations are healthier than others, as well as the policy development, research agenda, and resource allocation that flow from this framework. So if we think about this, this means that population health really encompasses factors at multiple levels from society and social and economic policies all the way to genetics um, and individual level uh, uh, biology. Now if we think about, if we really want to, if our mission is to improve the health of populations, uh, what, what do we really need to do in terms of the grand scheme of things? And I would argue there are two big things we need to do. One is shift population patterns. And this, this ref, uh, harkens back to the work of Jeffrey Rose, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, this idea of modifying whole distributions of risk factors, and that means acting at a pretty macro level, which are the drivers of these distributions, and also, of course, lowering risk in those at highest risk. And also, in addition to these shifting population patterns, I think the other big thing that we need to address if we want to improve population health in a significant way is to reduce inequities. Reduce inequities in health by class, by race, ethnicity, by gender, by place. So the population health approach or the population health framework, therefore, if we want to do these two critical things, requires us to think about multiple levels of organization. And critically, that means moving beyond health care. Also, taking seriously the idea of social biological interactions, the notion that we can't understand social patterning of health without understanding biology, but we can understand in many cases, how biology works if we don't understand context. And that context includes how people are related to each other in society. An explicit concern with health inequities and translation broadly defined. And I'll come back to what I mean by that towards the end. So these are four things that I think characterize a, a broad population health approach. So, so under this view, Population health certainly encompasses the individual level factors within the purview of classical clinical care, but broadens them to consider upstream determinants. And I think this is important, not only to effective interventions or policy, but also, I would argue, to comprehensive ideologic understanding of, of, of basic uh, processes driving health. So, five propositions that I'd like to share with you about population health and talk a little bit about their implications is first, that there are big population health questions that we do not have answers to. Second, that a biomedical approach alone is often not sufficient. Third, the complementary nature of observation and intervention. Fourth, complexity is everywhere and could explain some of the inconsistencies that we see in research findings. And fifth, the importance of bridging multiple types of evidence. And I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit in turn. Big questions with no answers. So I'd like to share with you a few big questions. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you may have others. But one big, big question is why the US does so poorly in health. This is an example of taken from a report um, that the Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine, put out a few years ago showing that US life expectancy is low at every age. In, and in both sexes, the rank is never better than 15th out of 17th until age 75. This is among high-income countries. So uh, 
quite poor performance. And this is across the board for multiple different causes of death. In fact, for every cause of death examined, young Americans lost more years of life before age 50 than did young people in peer high-income countries. So this is quite pervasive, and it, it affects not only mortality, but also a range of measures of morbidity. So this is one big question, and the, the, the truth is we don't have good answers to why this pattern exists. Another, another uh, big question is the spatial heterogeneity and race heterogeneity, in this case, in life expectancy. This is uh, taken from a paper that also got a lot of press a number of years ago, um, the Eight Americas, showing these dramatic differences, regional differences in life expectancy. Very, very big differences, as you can see on the right. You know, 10-year differences or more. This is another recent example, the increasing death rate among young adults, um, uh, which initially was, was described for primarily for white Americans living in rural areas, but now we know that it's actually happening across a range of race and ethnic groups and not restricted only to rural areas. So why, is this, why are these patterns happening? I would argue that in order to really understand what's happening, we need to take this broad population health approach. Another example has to do with things like differences in um, hypertension. Um, these very big race differences in hypertension that we see, the uh, uh, so, social factors don't fully explain them, at least the way we're looking at them. Genetics doesn't fully explain them, the way, at least the way we're looking at, at them either. And so what, what's going on here? How can we move beyond the, the approaches that we've been using to really integrate in order to really uh, shed light on, on the drivers of some of these differences? And, and not only in the prevalence, but also in things like, a, like a control of, of high blood pressure. Very, very big race differences, which, for which we still have no compelling explanations. My second proposition that is that in, in understanding these big questions and ma many other questions, potentially in population and health as well, the, the biomedical approach is often not sufficient. And, and how do we move beyond biomedicine? And, and I'd like to describe two ways, um, two examples. There may be other ways, but these are two examples. One has to do with enhancing understanding by integrating social context with genes and epigenetics. And the second has to do with enhancing actions and interventions by integrating social context into clinical care. And I'm going to show you a, a few examples of what I mean by this. This is one uh, example of a, a paper that uh, one of my former doctoral students, Paul Christine, worked on um, looking at the interactions between a genetic risk score for diabetes and neighborhood, uh, neighborhood food and physical activity environments. And so what this figure shows is that if we look at the independent effects of, of having above the median diabetes uh, genetic risk score and above the median and uh, adverse uh, uh, neighborhood environments, we see that the combined effect of, of, of having both factors is more than what we would have predicted from their independent effects. So this is what defines both on an additive and on a multiplicative scale. This is what, if, what defines interaction of our effect modification. So, you know, if these findings, of course, are replicated, what this would suggest is that it's in order to understand both the effects of the genetic risk score and the effects of the neighborhoods, we need to really look at them both, um, both together. And that the environment, uh, in looking at gene bioenvironment interactions, should encompass more than the traditional age and gender, for example, and behaviors to also think, think about things in the, uh, in the real external environment, such as neighborhood context. Another example, of course, is epigenetics. This is an uh, early paper showing how uh, identical twins diverged over time in their epigenetic profiles, and clearly this means that there are environmental influences on these, epi on these epigenetic markers. Um, uh, but we could get more specific than this. This is an example of a conceptual model from a, a, a project uh, led by uh, Jen Smith that was recently funded. Um, looking at the relationships between socioeconomic status and neighborhood characteristics, uh, DNA methylation, and gene expression in relation to cardiovascular risk. And just to show you a few uh, preliminary examples from this kind of work, uh, this is an example looking at the relationship between various social factors, childhood socioeconomic status, adult socioeconomic status, neighborhood social environment, and neighborhood disadvantage, uh, in relation to uh, methylation of stress reactivity and inflammation-related uh, genes. And what we observed is that there's, there's a patterning of, of, of methylation 
uh, associated with these exposures. Um, and and this, this patterning is in turn uh, the, related to uh, gene expression. So of course, what this means, we need in terms of the disease risk is, is something that needs to be further investigated, but it, it appears that we can detect some, some signals of the uh, social uh, environment on, um, on, on, on epigenetic markers. So the other, so, so in order to fully understand uh, the, the role of epigenetics as a mediator of, of other factors, we really need to think about uh, social factors in interaction with these, with these uh, processes. Um, the next uh, way of thinking, uh, moving beyond biomedicine that I wanted to touch on has to do with integrating social context into clinical care. And you may have heard about this because there's been a lot of interest in thinking about, well, can, can the addition of psychosocial and social factors uh, be used into, uh, into clinical practice or electronic health records, be used to enhance uh, patient care. Um, and this is just some examples of news items about this. Um, and and uh, there was a report from the Institute of Medicine uh, as well uh, a couple of years ago that recommended a series of domains that might be considered for systematic inclusion into electronic health records um, that, that might be useful in terms of potentially provide benefits to clinical medicine in terms of greater precision in diagnoses and treatment, uh, identifying important factors, referrals, uh, and tailoring and targeting of interventions in clinical research, and also potentially provide benefits to public health through improved um, the use of electronic health records uh, linked to these factors for surveillance, etiologic research, and policy evaluation. So there have been a number of publications that have done, you know, still very pretty simple things to uh, add uh, usually socioeconomic information based on neighborhoods to electronic health records in order to see the added value of this information in terms of uh, prediction uh, or in terms of uh, risk prediction in terms of uh, out outcomes, for example. Um, and, and of course, there have been uh, many, uh, there's been interest in, in thinking about this as an integrated data resource. Uh, one example to create, you know, on the left there, to create a platform uh, that integrates geographic data with, with electronic health record data, and of course the interest in the Precision Medicine Initiative of linking uh, genetic and other individual level patient data to uh, social and environment data. Um, you know, there are a number of challenges to this, of course. The first uh, is a measurement, systematic measurement of these social and environmental constructs is, is very challenging. Um, uh, so uh, that's, and also making sure the measurements are meaningful in the sense that they're really capturing the constructs that we think are relevant. Um, there are questions about the real utility of this to clinical practice. What is really the added value uh, of having this information? Uh, what is the added the value for research? There's the um, concern about uh, selection bias potentially, um, uh, which you know, uh, you know, obviously, depending on the, sample, the the size of the cohorts, that there may be some amelioration of that, but it's still a, a concern for many outcomes. And of course, adverse consequences potentially related to stereotyping patients because of the information that's collected and whether that's going to influence the way clinicians perceive patients and the decisions that they make in ways that are not necessarily better for patients. So, so a number of challenges I think that need to be addressed as we think about this. The third proposition that I wanted to share with you is the complementary nature of observation and intervention. And I think, that's, I think this is really uh, important because I think we tend to think of observation and intervention as two completely separate things when in fact um, uh, they're, they're not. Um, so the traditional observational approach uh, to research, which is what a lot of epidemiology is, is founded on, is this idea that we observe associations, we infer causes from that observation we propose interventions based on those inferred causes, and then we evaluate. This is sort of the traditional paradigm. Uh, but there are, of course, many challenges in drawing policy-relevant conclusions from, the, from, you know, from this circuit, from these observational studies, which, I'm, which you are, I'm sure, familiar with. Um, it, just the basic challenge of causal inference from observational data uh, and the possibility of incorrect causal inferences, cherry-picking, only the positive stuff gets published, the, the, the importance of replication and the difficulty in replication, particularly when different kinds of measures are used. Also the fact that particularly in, especially when we're looking at things like social determinants, we're often looking at causes that are very distal. 
with long latency periods and many intervening steps. So this makes the observational approach particularly challenging. And so this has raised questions about, well, and, and, and in addition, I would say, are the factors that we examine in observational studies really policy relevant? Are we even looking at the right factors? And, and there has been quite a bit of debate on this in the literature. These are a few quotes. Um, at the top there, uh, a quote from Sandro Galea saying, you know, uh, in practice, academic epidemiology now spends most of its time concerned with identifying the causes and distributions of disease in human populations and far less of its time and imagination asking how we might improve population health or with respect to health inequalities, we too often have the right answers to the wrong questions or researchers might improve the likelihood of their research having a wider policy impact by focusing less on describing the problem and more on ways to solve it. So this suggests that even if we were able to overcome the limits of observational studies in terms of drawing causal inference, we're just not looking at the relevant factors in terms of intervening. Um, so it really suggests that, yeah, we're doing, even if we're doing this piece right, maybe here we have a problem because the factors that we're looking at don't allow translation into intervention. What is the intervention that arises from that study? So what can we do to increase the relevance of observational population health research for policy? Well, of course, we can focus the research on specific policies or interventions. So the causal factors that we look at are the policies or interventions themselves. Um, and we can do this, of course, through ideally through randomized trials. Uh, unfortunately, in many of the, uh, for many of the factors that, that might be important in terms of upstream or macro level factors, sometimes, many times, randomization is in, not feasible. Um, or when it's feasible, it may be uninformative regarding the types of policies or interventions that are of greatest interest. So the kinds of things that were most interesting um, might, might not be um, possible to randomize. And then, you know, the other option, of course, is, uh, is uh, uh, randomized experiments, uh, natural experiments. Um, and of course, this may be a way out if the policies of interest have been implemented and if the time lags are reasonable, um, because we have to be able to detect things in relatively short time lags, and if appropriate counterfactuals can be identified. So unfortunately, these two conditions are are sometimes uh, not possible to meet. So we can't do randomized trials or the ones we can do, like the moving to opportunity experiment, which I'll talk about later in terms of randomized people to move out of poor neighborhoods to less poor neighborhoods, it doesn't inform the kinds of neighborhood level interventions that we, that might, be, that we might be most interested in. Or it may be difficult to identify natural experiments. So another option is to refine the observational work. Are there ways that we can refine the observational studies? Um, and uh, there's been a lot of recent discussion in the field on really improving, you know, utilizing quantitative counterfactual theory to improve, the, to improve both the design and the analysis of observational studies. Um, and so pushing towards a crisper definition of the treatment um, and under, you know, under, uh, uh, under this, uh, you know, way, this rigorous uh, application of quantitative counterfactual theory, only, the only causes that are truly identifiable are, quote, practicable, well-defined interventions. And so this has generated quite a bit of debate on the field on, well, what kinds of things under this paradigm are really identifiable causes? Um, and uh, you know, there have been multiple, multiple uh, papers, uh, methodologic papers discussing this very, you know, quite a fundamental issue in terms of what, cause, what factors can really be identified as causes in observational studies in a meaningful way. And so what are the implications of this debate for population health research? You know, many of the causes that we're interested in, I would argue, are social or environmental causes that are macro or distal, as I said, they're not easily reducible to a single intervention. And the definition of what's practicable can be problematic. You know, what, is, what, do, what do we mean exactly by practicable? Um, is it a policy that could be implemented but no one has implemented or what's the definition? And also, if only well-defined and quote, practicable interventions can be identified as causes, can many of the social factors we study even be thought of as causes? Can we think of you know, socioeconomic position as a cause or discrimination as a cause? Um, and if, 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 you know, if that's the case, if we can't, then 
you know, that would mean that our policy intervention recommendations can only be based on well-defined practicable interventions. And of course, this has generated quite a bit of concern among uh, uh, folks interested in these macro or, or more social determinants. Um, now, I think there's, you know, a little bit of a way out of this uh, dilemma, this debate. Um, and, and I put up a couple of quotes here from a commentary that I thought was particularly um, insightful. Um, and it says, uh, uh, the authors Gleamor and Gleamor said, there's a counterfactual interventionist notion of causation and a historical or more exactly ideological notion. Um, so the first one is of interest when one is designing a public policy to intervene to solve a problem, but then the historical or more exactly ideological notion is often of use when one is identifying a problem to solve. And so ideological causation does not always direct us to practicable interventions directly. That thing that I showed you doesn't always happen. Um, for that, we need to focus on causes that are feasibly and ethically manipulable. But it can provide us with the rationale for wanting to change outcomes. And I think this is really important. And in fact, you know, one could think about questions that are about ideology and questions that are about intervention. And the, the, you know, the intervention questions are more about specifically about these practicable, well-defined interventions, but I would argue that there's also an intersection between these two types of questions. Let me, let me tell you a little bit more concretely what I mean. Um, you know, we could create sort of a, a gradation of causes that go from broad antecedents leading to multiple causal pathways to specific characteristics to, to a hypothetical intervention to a practicable intervention, that is one that we think we can do now based on the current context, uh, to a practicable intervention under specific circumstances. And as we move up in this list, we are, you know, the breadth of the causal question increases, and as we move down, the specification of the process becomes uh, more uh, greater. Let me give you an example socioeconomic position, broad antecedent leading to multiple causal pathways, specific characteristic, education, a hypothetical intervention, increase years of education, a practicable intervention, provide economic incentive to continue education, and a practical intervention under specific circumstances, provide economic incentive to continue education to students in community colleges. So there's really, this is really a continuum um, where uh, ideology, you know, we go from ideology broadly defined to what's really implementation research at the, at the, at the more specific end. So, so this is why I think thinking about this complementary nature of observational ideologic research and intervention research is, is useful and moving beyond this slightly artificial dichotomy, are, I would argue, between these, these two things. And I'll return to this idea at the end when I talk about different kinds of evidence that might be relevant for population health. The fourth proposition I wanted to talk to you about is the idea that complexity is everywhere. Um, and, and let me give you, uh, you know, very schematic made up examples, but that I hopefully will be, um, will be helpful. So if we think about genes and the environment, I mean, let's imagine there are certain genetic factors that uh, are pre you know, predispose people to be more physically active. I'm sure they're, if they haven't been found yet, at some point they will be found. Um, there are, there's ancestry and of course parental genes. That parental genes are of course related to the genes of the offspring. Ancestry may be correlated with genetic factors. There's culture. Um, there are family norms that may uh, modify the effect of genetic factors. Um, and, and also there's a feedback loop. Family norms affect physical activity and physical activity in turn reinforces certain norms. And there are environments and peer groups that play a similar role. So here, isolating the effect of the gene or isolating the effect of the family norms is quite artificial because it's hard to understand the effect of this factor without understanding the system on, in which this factor is embedded. Another example, neighbor, the impact of neighborhoods and health, an area that my group has worked in, quite a bit. So uh, personal resources and, 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 and potentially preferences affect residential location. This may be modulated by discrimination. Uh, uh, residential location affects um, area, material, social, and advocacy resources, which in turn may reinforce residential segregation. 
these um, area resources affect the location of stores and physical activity resources, which in turn reinforce some of these social and physical characteristics. These location of resources may affect health behavior, potentially diet, physical activity behaviors, but then the behaviors of people in the neighborhood affect the resources there as well through a reinforcing mechanism. And then we have other factors like stressors and coping mechanisms that may play modulating roles as well. So similarly here, we have a system. Um, so, and these systems, the presence of these systems can give rise to what's been called policy resistance, which is the tendency for interventions to be defeated by the system's response to the intervention itself, or when obvious solutions fail or even worsen the situation. And I'm sure you can think of examples where this has happened in terms of well-intentioned interventions that have either not worked or even made things worse. So the question this raises, well, these, so, the, so these are really dynamic systems. <clears throat> and the feature, what I mean by dynamic systems is uh, that systems where there are factors at multiple levels, where there are heterogeneous and interdependent units, people, for example, uh, where there are feedbacks. Uh, this idea of endogeneity characterizes uh, all of these systems. Nonlinear effects, this idea that intervening at one place can cause effects uh, much later or uh, 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 distant in space and time. And this notion that you can have multiple paths to the same outcome. So people can get cardiovascular disease through several different pathways. There's not a single pathway. And similarly, the same cause can lead to different outcomes in different people, depending on uh, a range of other circumstances. Um, and this results in this idea of emergent patterns and that cannot easily be reduced to independent effects. So these, emer these emergent patterns are not magical things. They're, they emerge from the, the functioning of the system. Um, so this, this, you know, if you think about this, this probably characterizes a lot of health stuff. Uh, so a lot of population health problems. Um, so the question is, um, you know, should dynamic systems modeling approaches be part of the population health toolkit? And I'll, I'll return, what, is, what would that mean, um, practically speaking? Um, and I'll return to this uh, a little bit towards the end. And the fifth proposition has to do with this idea and this, uh, that, that uh, in part because of the, the complexity, um, that we really need to bridge multiple sources of evidence to understand the drivers of population health and to figure out what the best interventions might be. And I'm going to show you what I mean through an example from our own work, which has to do with the impact of neighborhoods on cardiovascular disease. So just a, you know, a very brief introduction, why even focus on neighborhoods? Well, uh, you know, neighborhoods are potentially context for both physical and social exposures that may be relevant to cardiovascular disease and other, and other health outcomes. Um, they have the potential, if we find that they're uh, causally related to outcomes because people are strong, are strong, you know, segregated into neighborhoods based on class and, and race and ethnicity, if neighborhoods uh, turn out to be important, neighborhood factors could be very important contributors to health disparities. And also because they have public, potentially public health and policy relevance, because there are specific interventions that we could propose on neighborhoods. In fact, uh, neighborhoods are changing all the time uh, for a variety of reasons, and we could capitalize and uh, you know, promote some of those changes to improve health. So that, this is what motivated uh, a, a, you know, a whole research agenda on neighborhoods and health that began uh, many years ago now. And the first generation was really about secondary data analysis of geographically linked epidemiologic studies using multi-level analysis. And, and census areas were used as proxies for neighborhoods. Um, and aggregate census socioeconomic characteristics, such as indices of deprivation, were used as very rough proxies for the actual ideologically relevant neighborhood attributes. And this is you know, an example of a paper that we published now many years ago that did just this, looking at the ARIC study. Uh, showing that uh, neighborhood disadvantage was associated with increased risk of uh, developing coronary heart disease after controlling to the extent that we could in an observational study with uh, so socioeconomic factors that we knew sorted people into different neighborhoods. But this, of course, 
raise many questions about, you know, was this causal? And if so, well, what is it about the areas that's important? Because th that's what we need to know in order to intervene. How, you know, how do these area features exert their effect? What's the spatial scale? What do we mean by neighborhood? It sounds vague. What are the time scales? And most importantly, can we change these characteristics and show an effect? And so this led to a, a, what I call generation two studies that really tried to measure direct, you know, do direct measurement of potentially health relevant neighborhood attributes through surveys, through uh, novel uses of surveys, through GIS and locational data, and through systematic social observation, which is a technique borrowed from sociology, to characterize, to observe various features of neighborhoods, and then, and then, and then combine the data in, in appropriate ways to improve the validity and reliability of the neighborhood level measurements. So there's been a lot of, a lot of development in the measurement aspects. Um, and then the, these studies looked at both at cross-sectional associations of these uh, more specific neighborhood attributes with with proximal health-related factors such as behaviors or stress biomarkers, and also a longitudinal studies linking area features to incident disease or to changes in health over time. And this is just an example of some cross-sectional work. This is taken from projects that we have been involved in. But there have been many, many groups working in this area over the past few years showing that Things like access to uh, healthy foods, physical activity resources, walkability are related to the behaviors that you might think they might be related to after controlling for factors related to the sorting of people into neighborhoods, or social environment is related to, for example, things like sleep. Now, of course, this is cross-sectional data. It's observational data. There are many questions about uh, confounding, many questions about reciprocal causation. Um, going on, but it, it's compatible, but not demonstrative of a causal effect. There has been some longitudinal work, uh, which of course is an improvement over the cross-sectional data, showing that you know, people who experience a change in their neighborhood environment experience a simultaneous change in some of the things that you think might be related to that environment uh, using methods that, like fixed effects models that control for time invariant person level characteristics or uh, looking at uh, uh, neighborhood factors and incident disease like incident diabetes. So there's been some longitudinal work as well confirming some of these patterns and su suggesting that there may be some, some causal impact going on. However, um, of course, this work is purely observational and so it has all the caveats around observational uh, data. The results have not always been consistent. Uh, there's been a lack of comparability of many of the neighborhood measures that have been used and this makes the literature very difficult to summarize um, the time frame that we've been able to look at because of this, this, this you know, challenge that many of these things may be operating over very, very long periods. The time frame that we've looked at may not always be the most causally relevant time frame. So we have to make assumptions like that what we measure today is probably what these people have experienced over a longer etiologically relevant period, which may or may not be the case. And so this means that the implications for intervention of this work uh, you know, to many have, um, have, have raised uh, questions. So naturally, the next step in the observation would be to do an experiment, right? Do an experiment and see whether some of these things that we saw observationally, if we randomize to, to groups, do we see an effect? And there, there haven't been many experiments, unfortunately. This is one example of an experiment moving to opportunity experiment where uh, individuals uh, were randomized to move to a low, uh, from, from, a, from a poor neighborhood to a less poor neighborhood. And um, this was mostly women, uh, low income women. And, and the, the study documented improvements uh, in BMI and in indicators of uh, prediabetes. However, interestingly, the conclusions of the paper uh, you know, highlight, yes, the opportunity to move from a neighborhood with a high level of poverty to one with a lower level was associated with modest but potentially important reductions in the prevalence of extremely sensitive diabetes, but the mechanisms underlying these associations remain unclear but need further investigation. And this is really important because these mechanisms are going to tell us, well, if we want to do an intervention that's not about moving people, which may not be the feasible intervention in terms of addressing these determinants of health, we really need to understand the mechanisms because that will tell us on what factors we should be intervening. So this is an example where the experiment motivates new and observations. Now, experiments sometimes yield unexpected results. 
And just to give you a few examples, the same MTO study showed some unfavorable short-term effects in some groups, for, for example, particularly in young boys, in terms of behavioral outcomes. Um, cash transfer programs, which are programs where people are randomized to receive low-income families are randomized to, to receive uh, income transfers, have shown some adverse effects, for example, on BMI. Um, and some neighborhood level interventions uh, to improve uh, food access have shown uh, little or no effects. So what does this mean? This means that we need to understand why these interventions work and why they don't work on, or under what conditions they might work. And this brings us back to this idea of systems because the, 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 the effectiveness of an intervention may depend on the broader context of factors within which that intervention is, is, is embedded. And so a systems approach is quite different than the traditional paradigm in health research because it starts with defining the components of the system which requires abstraction um, and setting bounds. So it's not about putting everything in, it's about putting what we think is most important in terms of driving the dynamics of the system, developing a formal model in order to simulate, integrate existing knowledge, simulate and explore the functioning of the system and answer some fundamental questions about dynamics, and then draw conclusions about the drivers of patterns and the plausible impact of interventions under different conditions. So this can give us different kinds of insights into causal processes, test interventions which may not be feasible in the real world, identify new points of interventions that we hadn't even thought of, and also identify and understand the reasons for unexpected effects. So I, so, and also the type of question changes. So it changes from a question like, is proximity to supermarkets as a proxy for healthy food access associated with better diet after adjustment for individual level SCS, the traditional epidemiologic approach, which has, I think has been useful, but it doesn't give us a complete answer, to something like, what is the plausible impact of health inequalities of a strategy to subsidize, subsidize the location of supermarkets under various spatial patterning scenarios? Or from what markers of genetic variability are associated with BMI, do environmental factors modify this relationship? To what are the plausible contributions of gene environment correlation and gene environment interaction to BMI differences by income? How is this modified by the degree of contagiousness of behaviors linked by, to BMI? So the question changes. Or it becomes a much more a nuanced question and much more conditional on other things in the system. And so there, we have been some attempts to employ these kinds of strategies to the study of neighborhood effects. This is one example that uh, Amy Auchincloss, colleague of mine, uh, led a number of years ago. Uh, and I don't have time to get into the details of this, but basically we uh, used agent-based models to, do, to explore two questions. One, about whether simple spatial segregation absents any differences in people's preferences or price differences across neighborhoods, whether the spatial segregation alone was sufficient to create income differences in diet, and then how various interventions, for example, price interventions, um, or uh, health education to modify preferences could modify these differences. And so, you know, we, we had a, a model that included households and stores. Assumptions, of course, are in the model. The model, however, integrates it, all available information. And then the model can be used to look at how income differentials change under different scenarios. So, of course, you know, there are many assumptions built into this approach. There are issues about do we have the data to inform these kinds of models, when does the model yield new insights that you wouldn't have predicted from what you already put into the model? Um, and, and often this raises more, in the process of developing these models, both conceptually and in terms of the, the, the operationalization, we realize all the gaps we have in knowledge, things that we really don't know, that then we have to go back and do observation, better observation or better experiments to understand so that then we can improve the model. And so, uh, so it, the systems modeling, in fact, built, you know, feeds back into the need for experiments and observations. And then, of course, in, in public health um, and health generally, uh, there's often action that we have to take, even in the face of incomplete evidence sometimes, because, it's all, because we have to. Um, and, you know, uh, returning to the neighborhood example, these are some examples of actual policies or interventions that, for example, in increased access to healthy foods in, um, in food deserts. And, and, and uh, you can see that sometimes the results were positive, sometimes, sometimes they weren't. And so this is a situation where it's the simple evaluation of action, think policies that were implemented, can also suggest 
uh, uh, new questions that we need to go back to in observational studies and experiments or incorporating to systems modeling. So, so I would argue that really we have an evidence generating system and that we have to think more about this sort of quadrangulation of evidence as a way to enhance our ability to understand these very complex population health problems. But a single approach is not going to be sufficient. And we're not that used to doing this kind of uh, integration, I think. So in the few minutes that I have left and sort of building on these five propositions, uh, what I'd like to do is share with you sort of a, a broad research agenda um, to, uh, to advance population health research. And the first area uh, that I'd like to say a few words about is, is etiologic research. I, I, think there's, I think there's still a lot to learn in terms, about, in terms of etiology, but etiology in the broad sense, um, etiology in, uh, in terms of linking health and health disparities to distal and upstream determinants. I think we have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, good information. Some of it is more descriptive than, 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 than causal. Um, and I think there are ways that we can improve use methods for improved causal inference. There's been a lot of development in the field over the past few years in thinking about this. Integration of new types of data that we have not brought together before, electronic health record data, uh, the, the very large variety of georeference uh, data uh, among uh, um, social media data. I mean, there are incredible uh, opportunities to think creatively about how we can bring new data to bear on this. Incorporating this notion of feedbacks and dependencies, so this systems thinking and systems tools into this etiologic research, particularly of these more distal kinds of factors, and improved synthesis and meta-analysis. I think in, uh, in this area, we don't do a very good job at all of synthesizing our findings. And there are you know, complicated reasons for that that include the fact that we're often measuring very complicated things, and therefore the measures are difficult to harmonize. However, I think, uh, I think it's very important that we think about ways that we can uh, either post facto harmonize or, or harmonize more going forward so that we can synthesize this body of work more, more effectively because otherwise we often, send up, we often end up throwing up our hands and saying, well, we don't know that all these findings are all very different and we can't really summarize them. And I think this is, this is a really big challenge for the world of, um, of uh, social determinants uh, in particular. And then cross-context comparisons. I, I think we can learn a lot from comparisons across countries, across regions, across cities, and we don't really capitalize on that as much as we should in understanding etiology. For example, race differences in things like hypertension in the US are not invariant over space. They vary. Why do they vary? What are the factors that cause them to be bigger in some places and smaller in other places? These are the kinds of questions that we can only answer if we do regional comparisons or even cross-country comparisons. Another area of uh, research is mechanistic understanding. And I think there's still value to understand. You know, sometimes we, uh, you, you may argue, well, if we know the distal cause, why do we need to understand the mechanism? I think there's still value to uh, some mechanistic research particularly if it, if it helps to confirm or legitimize distal causes by being able to articulate the proximal mechanisms through which those distal causes operate. Sometimes, you know, maybe we have observational data on the distal causes, we're not sure whether we think, you know, uh, skeptics may argue that that's not causal. If we can, if we can articulate the, the specific mechanism, it strengthens the causal argument. And, and I, here, I think, is where the social biology interface the kinds of things looking at social influences on epigenetic markers or gene expression, I think, can be particularly um, useful. Um, also, this idea of what I call sort of complex mediation. We tend to think of mediation as a very, you know, linear thing. A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D. But maybe A leads to B, but B interacts with C. Um, so, a particular, for example, cardiovascular disease, we think of stress and behaviors as two separate things as two parts of the mediating pathway. But in fact, those things probably reinforce each other because stress affects behaviors and behaviors affect stress. And we're not really looking at that in, in, in the analyses that we're looking at. For that, we need to really think about synergisms, feedbacks, context dependency when we're understanding uh, mediation. And then I think another mediating pathway that we have not focused on so much, particularly from the point of view of social determinants, has been healthcare. And I think, you know, for good reason, 
uh, there has been an emphasis on focusing on things that are outside the healthcare system because those things perhaps were not as, um, you know, they didn't receive as much attention in, in some cases under the more traditional biomedical paradigm. But I think it also is important to think about healthcare, access to healthcare, quality of healthcare as a mediator as well of some, uh, uh, of, some of these more distal effects. And so I think it's nice to see this sort of interest within the clinical world on social determinants on health, on uh, incorporating information outside, you know, uh, 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 about the social and physical context that the patient lives in into clinical research. The third area where I think uh, there's a, a lot of research opportunity is policy evaluation. And really, this is about evaluating the health impact of policies both within and outside healthcare. Um, and I think broadening the range of policies that we look at, education policy, taxation policy, urban planning, social policy. And this is, you know, this is of course not easy to do, but I think with increasing data availability and increasing data that we have, there's possibility for doing creative linkages that would allow us to look at this, um, you know, pretty, pretty rigorously. Broaden the tools, so of course, uh, it, it, natural experiments, also some of the systems modeling approaches that I, uh, that I talked about, and also interactions between different types of policies. So this idea that a health, the impact of a healthcare intervention, so a patient-oriented intervention to improve blood pressure control may be modified by what's happening in the, in the patient's uh, neighborhood or context or something that the city where the patient lives has been implemented, for example, in terms of uh, salt or, or in terms of uh, sugar-sweetened beverage taxes, et cetera. So looking at the interactions between different kinds of interventions, patient-oriented interventions and more uh, environmental or broad policy interventions. That might help us understand under what conditions some of the individual targeted or patient-oriented interventions work and under what conditions they may not work as well. And also, particularly the impact of policies on disparities. I think this is an area where there hasn't been that much work, and it's, I think it's a, it's a critically important area because, as we know, uh, some, you know, there may be interventions and policies that increase disparities. And so thinking about disparities themselves as an outcome uh, is, is also very important and an area where, where, um, where there's opportunity for, for more research. And the fourth area is implementation research, and I know this is an area that has received increasing interest here at NIH, um, but particularly disparities-focused implementation research. So, uh, you know, you know why, why do some interventions not work in certain groups? Uh, uh, what factors influence the adoption of proven interventions in certain population groups? What structural factors affect that? Things about the healthcare system. Uh, what perceptual factors, things about, you know, a doctor's perception of whether this patient is going to benefit or not. Um, factors influence the performance of proven interventions in different population groups. This is true effect modification in the, in the epidemiologic sense, but why? You know, why do some interventions work in some groups but not others? That, in a way, is, as I said before, ideo ideologic understanding too, because it's about understanding how context modifies the effect of another factor. And implementation science beyond the clinic. And I think this is very important. Um, a, a narrow view of implementation science is really about, this is a typical definition, it's about uh, the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic update of proven clinical treatments, which is uh, very important, I think. But there's also a broader way of thinking about implementation uh, that has to do with when, how, and why is research about population health translated into policies in general? Um, uh, what are the perceptions about the causes of health or ill health among the public and policymakers? How do that, how does that, what drives those perceptions? Because that's critical to determining what policy actions are prioritized or supported by the public. What's the process of communicating and understanding evidence about drivers of population health and health disparities? This is more, um, more um, qualitative research about understanding how the evidence that we can get out there is understood and incorporated. And this is an example of a paper published by a colleague of mine, Jonathan Pirtle, just recently, uh, where he led a survey of uh, health commissioners and mayors of cities asking them some very simple questions. Uh, for example, do you agree with the statement that health disparities exist in my city, and do you agree with the statement city policies can have an impact on health disparities? 
And as you can see, you know, a lot of the, you know, not, not, not all of them, but, but, but a, a large majority of mayors and health commissioners either agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that health disparities exist in my city, and yet responses to whether city policies can have an impact of health, on health disparities was much more mixed. So what's going on here? What, 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 you know, what's the understanding of policies that, that these mayors and health commissioners have, and, and, uh, and what, what can we do uh, to enhance uh, their, you know, the, uh, the, the use of the evidence that we have about health disparities and policies uh, by, by these uh, leaders. So to finish up, you know, these are my five propositions. There are big population health questions that we don't have answers to. Biomedical approach is uh, often not sufficient alone. Complementary nature of observation and intervention. Complexity is everywhere and could explain inconsistencies and bridging the need really to take seriously the idea that we need to really bridge different types of evidence. And this, of, of course, has implications for the kinds of research that's supported um, and um, encouraged. And uh, in summary, uh, population health problems and health inequities, which are an integral part of population health problems, as I said, are, are big complex problems. And I think there's an extraordinary opportunity today for integration of social, environmental, behavioral, and biologic factors and new data to help us shed better light on the drives of population health integration of different types of evidence and analytical tools in ways that are, go beyond uh, the approach, what we've been doing uh, up to now, uh, a new way of thinking about the relations between etiologic research, implementation science, and policy evaluation is really interrelated, um, and systems thinking, I think, as an organizing framework. This isn't necessarily about using systems models for everything, not at all. There are many caveats and many uh, there are situations when modeling, systems modeling is useful or is not useful, but I think the systems thinking, this perspective of thinking systemically, I think can be very um, informative and helpful in framing questions and also the evidence that we have. So just to finish up, this is a quote that I like a lot from some uh, forester who some argue is sort of father of complex systems thinking, and he says, and the complex system causes are usually found not in prior events, but in the structure and policies of the system. And I think this is the challenge that we face in population health, that the cause is not a prior event, but something about the way the system is organized. And so this is our challenge as researchers to really figure out ways in which we can understand the functioning of that system so that we can shift it to move in a more uh, health producing uh, direction. Um, and I'd just like to thank many, many people. I'm sure there are many people on this list who are uh, many people who are not on this list who should be on it, but these are many collaborators and colleagues I've had over the years who've contributed to some of the work that I showed you today, and of course, uh, funding from NHLBI, NIMHD, OBSSR, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, among others. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments or questions. I have uh, two microphones set up, so uh, uh, I encourage people to step up to the microphones and ask questions. Well, congratulations for looking at the complex issues of healthcare. So, what you say it makes sense, but it is below the head level. It is so, what? I'm sorry? Below the head level. <laughs> so, when it comes to mental health, drug abuse, and gun violence, we know the issues and we know what should be done, but there is a reluctance. So in those cases, all these hypotheses and all these uh, conjectures and how to approach them, it should be working, but it doesn't. And also there's a cost issue, which you did not mention at all, because all these things cost money. So how do you deal with at least the issues of gun violence, say? Well, you're alluding to another big issue that I did not talk about, obviously, which is the fact that often we have evidence to support certain kinds of policies or actions, but for, num for you know, evidence is not the only thing that affects what's done, obviously. <laughs> there are whole, it's much more complicated than that. It would be very naive to think that decisions about policy are made only based on evidence or lack of evidence. There are a whole bunch of other factors that are influencing, and I think this is part of the debate that we engage in as as scientists, but also as individuals and as citizens in terms of um, creating the conditions so that the right, what we think are the right policies are implemented, but it, it has to do with many uh, complicated social, economic, and political issues. So I, I think you're right. And I did not, that this was, does not address that. It's a whole other very important issue. Yeah, but then when it, the question comes, the funding I heard 
has been completely cut out from uh, the issues of surveying gun violence, looking at the issues and how to intervene. So again, there is a, there is a significant issue that is not tackled and there is a reluctance. So I guess somebody has to stand up with some courage and attack. And yes, thank you and right. good luck. Thank you. One of the things that you um, are proposing, uh, I think, is to, uh, sp at least this was the way I wrote it down, you can correct me if I uh, didn't get this right, spend less time just observing and more time intervening. Would you say that's a fair? Well, I think I'm not, I, I, I think what the point I was uh, trying to make is that we need to do both and that we can, that we can uh, learn about the potential for interventions from observations that are well analyzed mm -hmm. and that we can learn about etiology from observing the impact of interventions. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need both. I think, I think there's some kinds of questions for which we still need, you know, the only way we're gonna be able to answer them is by doing better, more rigorous observations. And there's some questions in which, yes, we should intervene, but make sure that we're evaluating those interventions in ways that help inform our, our ideologic understanding in addition to the impact of that specific intervention. Right. I, I also heard you arguing for um, uh, using observational methods uh, to evaluate interventions more than uh, perhaps we do. Uh, this combination of um, uh, observational studies, modeling, and uh, experimentation, the, the, a, a virtual cycle, if you will, that you were describing uh, is an intriguing one because uh, many of us tend to think of observation, then intervention, maybe a little more observation than intervention, but it's, uh, yours seems to be uh, a more systematic and organized approach. Well, I think, I think that these three things, observation, experimentation, and, and, and modeling, are, are really should be seen as interrelated and reinforcing each other. Um, that it's not a linear pathway, you know, from observation to intervention. I think thinking about it that way causes us to lose opportunities. Um, so yes, I think you captured what I was, was trying to say. Hi, uh, in your opinion, uh, do you think we need um, different standards of scientific rigor for systems in which there are no truly independent variables like the systems that you're describing? Do I think we need different? Different standards of scientific rigor because that, that's a big discussion we're having right now at, at NIH about yeah. you know, scientific rigor and, and designing cohorts in such a way that you get statistically significant results and things like that. But in a system like you're describing where there really are no truly independent variables, it, it, you know, the question is do you need a, a totally different kind of math for that or do you apply the same math differently? Well, I think that's a very, very good question that you're raising. I think we should always aspire to the maximum scientific rigor, whatever we're doing. However, we should not assume that the only scientific rigor is a randomized clinical trial. There are, very, there are ways to do rigorous science that involves observation or that involves systems modeling or that involves experimentation. Um, so there's no, you know, uh, scientific rigor is not only an experiment. Right. Thank you. And in fact, sometimes we can be misled by the results of experiments. So we may not be able to explore the most important questions using experiments. So if we really want to take seriously improving population health, we need to broaden the set of tools that we're using. And of course, use them rigorously, absolutely. All of them can be used rigorously or not rigorously. That's not the tool itself, it's how it's used. Thanks very much. You gave us an awful lot to think about of, of things we need to, uh, to work on. Um, the, can I ask you to, to just speculate on uh, what, how grants should be packaged uh, that would make, uh, make this work move forward? I mean, we have a lot of mechanisms, but traditionally the most prestigious and most of our money is going into R01s, discrete questions, uh, five-year max and the rest. How does this fit with what you see as the research yeah. agenda? 
Well, I think, you know, the, 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 the system, the sort of investigator-driven um, award system, I think has, has many benefits, and I think it has yielded, you know, very important work. At the same time, I think it does incentivize a certain type of research, right? Uh, and, and it incentivizes uh, research that is uh, very narrowly focused, that builds, you know, is not super risky, <laughs> something that, you know, that the investigator is quite confident they can do and deliver on. And in fact, that's what they were evaluated on in part. Um, it, it, it doesn't encourage exploration of new methods um, as much. Um, it doesn't encourage um, you know, working with the real world of very messy data that we have out there. So I think, um, you know, thinking about other mechanisms, including, you know, other, you know, other kinds of broader initiative centers or other kinds of infrastructure kinds of, uh, of, of, of awards that will allow building capacity to do this broader, you know, set this broader research agenda is, is, I think, is really important because if we don't do it, I think it'll be very difficult to break out of the, you know, the traditional thing that we've been doing for so long. And, and it really, I think it really incentivizes investigators to keep doing what they're doing over and over again, honestly. Um, and and, and yeah, not always. I mean, uh, obviously, there are many examples of very innovative research that has been funded using the, the R1 mechanism. But I think it does have that potential uh, disincentive. So I'm uh, George Plopper from Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm not with NIH, but I'm here because it's a public uh, presentation. And I'm, I have full disclosure, I'm a cell biologist, not an epidemiologist. But I'm struck by the parallels between the, the way that you're describing the problems in population biology with the similar problems that cell biologists are dealing with now treating a tissue as a population and mm -hmm. trying to find neighborhoods and all the rest of the patterns. Mm -hmm. And as, as I'm following that thread through, I can say that at least in the field of cell biology, some time ago we hit an inflection point where the more data we gathered, the harder it was to use it. Mm -hmm. And the consequent response is the data commons and the atlasing. Yeah. And so because I heard this from you, and I don't have a lot of background here, I'm wondering, has that inflection point hit in your field? And if not, do you see it coming? And what do you, what do you propose NIH does about it? The inflection point in terms of having data that we don't know how yeah, to. Yeah, when, when the return on your data gathering yeah. starts to diminish. Uh, I think that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's happened already, but it's, it's you know, I think that is a big, you know, thinking, um, you know, there is an explosion of, you know, data and big data, all those, and some of the things that are now called big data are things that we've been doing for a long time, they're just now called big data. But, but, um, but I think there is um, a risk, which is that sort of the, that we will stop thinking <laughs> and, and, and just accumulate data and then, and then not really be able to draw any meaningful conclusions from that data. You know, that being said, I think, you know, the, the idea of, you know, uh, more discovery science and machine learning approaches, I think, can be, you know, an interesting complement to the more sort of traditional hypothesis-driven approach that has driven, that has characterized most of health research. But at the same time, I do think that we need to be, you know, that there is a danger that, uh, that we will just be pooling together a lot of data and, and really not be able to make a lot of sense out of it. And that some of the data that we pull together will really make no sense, you know. So, so I think thinking carefully about what we mean by big data and what kinds of data we really want to pool is very important, yeah. Thank you. It's a good, very good point. Do we have other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. You, you kind of hit an inflection point, I think, in most of the sciences where big data is kind of overwhelming. But there's a common sense way of dealing with that. And you can go back to ancient societies such as the Roman Empire, which were known for their public health. And they survived quite a long time and did quite well. I'm not sure what their life expectancies were, but I would think that if you have some common sense, rather than go what, what people used to refer to as the, the law of diminishing returns and go back and investigate historical models that seem to work well and use that as a base to kind of come back. Because just mishmashing what you're getting from electronic records and this and that and the other without setting a model and what is possible and what has been accomplished in the past 
seems to be an exercise in futility. No? Yeah, it I seems mean, to me if you don't have a model you're shooting for, if you say, for example, we have this neighborhood, this, that, and the other, this is a realistic goal for this neighborhood, and then do your, your, your investigation in terms of that. And my other point was just historical models might be of some value. Maybe not. I don't know. But the Romans seem to do it pretty well for a, quite a long time, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't intend to imply that, um, that there's that there's no utility to uh, to all these rich data sources that we're able to pull together. I think there's a lot of utility. I think we just have to be smart about using them and maybe looking at some historical examples may be helpful. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to encourage everyone to join us in the uh, library. We have some refreshments. Uh, you can have a chance to talk to uh, uh, Dr. Diaz Ru uh, at uh, further link over there. So please join us in the library. Thank you.